Hi all, welcome to TFOM, the future of meetings. Uh, I'm Professor Alan Duffy, lead scientist at the Royal Institution of Australia and an astronomer at Swinburne University of Technology. Uh, it is my pleasure to be uh, the, the host for this session. I want to kick things off by uh, acknowledging the traditional uh, uh, custodians of the land from which I am uh, streaming, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay my respect to uh, respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend those respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders from wherever you uh, are, are viewing, participating now or on their traditional lands. Joining me is a true legend, uh, Marita Cheng. AM is the founder and current CEO of Orbot, our bot. I keep saying it wrong every time, Marita. I'm so sorry. I said it wrong I... all the time as well. I was like, oh, is it? I mean, because you think Australia, Orbot, but then I was like, yeah. oh, but I want our, because it's our robot. Our, yeah. So it's our robot, but it also has a deeper meaning, right? Oh, it's, yeah, it's got lots of meanings. It's it, like one of them is like, it's not just your robot or my robot, it's our bot. It's, you know, it's our robot, our bot. Um, another one is um, in Japanese, like AU, um, AU is to meet. So it's, a, it's like robots that are around meeting or human connection or uh, yeah, just helping humans. Yeah. So this and is a telepresence robots. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, that's our first product. And, and of course, like the nice, the nice thing about it is also like AU, Australia, but so lots of cool hidden meanings there. I love it. I didn't realize it was such a Dan, Dan Brown sort of kind of like, <laughs> oh, we were going to go down with symbology. Um, I, it's worth pointing out for everyone else uh, watching, uh, you have a host of awards and accolades, the 2012 uh, Young Australian of the Year. You've been recognized in the Forbes 30 under 30 list in 2016. In 2018, you were the world's top 50 women in technology. Uh, uh, list by Forbes. So an all round superstar, you focused on technology, robotics in particular, making it accessible, making it inclusive, pushing, uh, pushing the boundaries of technology, um, as well as uh, engaging it to a wider and younger audience. So for many reasons, you are a legend. Uh, I thought I'd kick off our chat with something super easy, which is just describe to me your entire vision for the future of work. Well, uh, you know, I think the, the world has been trending this way where more people are going remote, more people want more time to spend with their family. Um, you know, and for the past six months, we spent so much time with our family. We spent so much time at home. Um, so we've really taken it to the extreme there. Um, but yeah, even, even before that, like, uh, like, you know, even when you travel so much, it, 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 sometimes it feels like you don't spend that much time in the office anyway. Uh, so I think, after this pandemic, there's, there's going to be more of that. Like you've seen companies go remote entirely, uh, like Atlassian, Facebook, um, Twitter, where you don't, you don't ever have to go back to the office. Some companies with like an asterisk. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I think you're going to see people move away from the, the expensive uh, cities and move to places that are, have more affordable real estate and, and perhaps more nature and, and perhaps high quality of life as a result. Is it just about that remote working though? It, do you see the more systemic or, or structural change in, in how we perceive work, our relationship with work as much as just the presence in the office? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I, I think that, that, you know, there's, there's more people who have different contracts in terms of how they structure their work. Um, I mean, you yourself, you're a professor, you're a startup entrepreneur, um, you, you, you speak um, to the media about a whole host of topics and, and astronomy. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm similar, like I have a whole host of uh, gigs that I do where I, I have my startup, then I have my other startups and, you know, new projects. And, and then I also speak to audiences about robotics and the future of work and um, diversity. And, and so um, I think, yeah, people are definitely thinking about how they structure their life and, um, and their work so that it, it works more for them. Um, I, I think it, it, it's another era where you, uh, like in, in another time, you would choose a company, you'd go there after university, and then you'd, you'd stay there for like many, many years. But now you know, people might get into a big prestigious company, but then 
by the time they're in their early 30s, they might realize this is, this is not for me. This isn't what I want. I don't want to be stressed all the time. I don't want to be traveling every single weekend. I don't want to not see my friends, not see my family. I want, I want flexibility and I'm willing to um, be creative with how I structure my pay in order to achieve that, whether that be like uh, being paid less um, in order to have that flexibility or, or, or yeah, I mean, with a lot of this remote working stuff that will take place, especially with the tech companies, they're saying, if you stay in a place like San Francisco, that's really expensive, we'll pay San Francisco market rates. But if you decide you're going to move to Wisconsin and, and the market rate there is much lower, then we'll pay Wisconsin market rates. And so that's a trade-off that people will choose to make. Okay, we've, we've actually got a question uh, on this from uh, Vanessa Moss, who's, who's pulling rank as the, one of the organizers for this event. So thank you, Vanessa, for your efforts. But how do you ensure a level playing field and, and that equity and, and equality where um, you have this style, this hybrid way of, of working or interacting? It's clearly going to be easier for those who perhaps have less home duties, shall we just put it that way, right? I think, I think we can imagine how this, this may not be a fair future. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely something that we have to navigate. Um, and uh, I think that's something that people have been navigating through the pandemic. Uh, mm. I, I mean, with, with uh, e even though parents are working from home, um, like with the kids there, like it's, uh, I, I think for some parents, it doesn't feel like um, they have time to work because they also have to, uh, they also have caregiving duties to, to, their, to their children. Um, and so I think, especially like in the time of COVID, you, you can't like pay for help because, because of the, the health risks. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and, and so I think, yeah, that's definitely something that we'll have to navigate. Like how, how do we make this equitable or how do we make this fair? But I mean, I think that's part of a, a larger conversation about, about uh, equity in the workplace and, mm -hmm. and division of home duties um, and uh, in, ensuring yeah, equal opportunities for, for all people. And, and I guess ensuring uh, inclusivity through robotics, that, that has actually been one of the uh, successes of, of your efforts with robotics. And this, this actually was quite surprising to me. I've always, you know, uh, I've not seen that robotics could assist in that way. So maybe expand upon, you know, perhaps that surprising opportunity that robotics presents. Yeah, sure. I think when I was starting my company, I, I thought who would actually benefit from robots the most? And... I, I thought, well, people with limited upland mobility or people with uh, a disability would would benefit the most, um, and it would give them abilities beyond what what even we can do. Um, and so that's why I started building robotic arms for people with limited upland mobility. And then, um, and then I, I thought, oh, it'd be great to build something that even more people can access. And so. Uh, had a lot of people say that they wanted a telepresence robot because they lived two and a half hours away from their office in Melbourne um, and they commuted like a couple of times a week, but it was annoying to drive all that way and drive all that way back. And, you know, they just liked hanging out on their farm and living on their farm and looking after their kids and spending time with their wife. Uh, and so they said, I, I really want a robot. Um, and also I don't, when my team go to meetings, um, and they bring me on a laptop, it's kind of clunky. And I need to tell my team, oh, point me slightly to the left or slightly to the right. I can't really see. I can't really see what's going on there. And that interrupts the flow of conversation. Um, it's, it, you're interrupting it with like logistics. Uh, and so with the telepresence robot, that person can then look wherever he wants. He can look to the left, look to the right, move his head up, move his head down. Like he, he's, got that, he's, got, he's got that freedom to be his own person. Uh, in this other office and then I had another friend who said oh it'd be so great if um, our conference we could have we could have people from all over Australia uh, it was a conference for young people and they had it in Melbourne the first year Sydney the second year and they said well what we found in Melbourne is that a lot of Melbourne uh, centric people people who live near Melbourne were attending the Sydney one a lot of uh, people around Sydney attended and we, this is a conference for young people all over Australia how can we get more young people all over Australia to attend uh, like these ro like having something like a robot would mean that people from all over the country could attend. And, and so it was those conversations that made me think, oh, it would be good to create something that's accessible to a lot more people uh, in terms of allowing them to connect and have that autonomy in remote locations. Is that, is it such a dramatic change? I would love to 
to give the telepresence robot a go, quite frankly, to, to get a sense of this, but does it change the interaction for the person using it as well as those in attendance in, the, in that meeting? Is it a more natural, fuller bandwidth kind of experience? Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, like traditionally in meetings, you might have whoever's um, like Zooming or Skyping in like on the wall, on the big screen, yeah. everyone can see them and they can see everyone on the table and that's it. Um, but when that person's a telepresence robot, they're just another person sitting around the table. They're just like another face around the table. Mm. And so when Alan's talking, when you're talking, the robot can just like turn and look at you or when, you know, Vanessa's talking, turn and look at them or when I'm talking, kind of turn and look at me. And so it's, it's really interactive. Um, and it, it's really immersive because you're not just like stuck doing what the technology is stuck, you know, looking where the AV guy pointed you five years yeah. ago, you know, you're, you're pointing wherever you want to go. And then when the, the colleagues, you know, want to go out for a coffee break, um, you know, telepresence robot can, can, uh, tag along and, and walk with people and talk with people. And so it's much more immersive and, um, and it's much more fun because you're, you have to be actively engaged and not just. The conversation but also well where am i looking um and i have that choice to look anywhere now looking into the future we we see incredible changes in robotics vr ai you know just just mixed reality experiences um and glenn reese has asked about where do you actually see the jobs say 50 years hence um being in person i mean what, what what's left Oh, 50 years in person. I mean, I think, I think people want to be around other people. Um, I mean, I think that's something that um, people have, have definitely felt and realized during pandemic lockdown. Like I miss people. I miss hanging out with people. I, I miss just collaborating with people. I miss, um, you know, even just sitting next to someone and not talking to them because even that builds trust. And um, like, yeah, even seeing how that person has tiny interactions with the wait, the waiter or other people on the street, you know, that, that builds trust in that this person's a decent person and I want to hang out with them and I want to work with them. Um, and so I think, yeah, you know, a lot of people miss being around other people. And so it will, will be a choice that people are around other people and, and, and want to collaborate and work with them. Okay. But I mean, I think, I think as well, like as we found during pandemic, you know, humans are incredibly adaptable and mm. um, they can, work with other people that they've never met before and work really productively if they make a really conscious effort to build trust in the relationship, even over Zoom. Yeah, well, on that point, it's certainly something I've, I've experienced. My Zoom interactions, and I know there's a number of questions about this point, have been uh, fine when it's an existing relationship. It's, it's exhaustive, but you, know, we get, you get there, you get a bit of Zoom fatigue. But building a new collaboration has been so much harder, I've found, without that personal interaction, the trust. In what way do you see your, your devices, your companies supporting that initial trust building exercise or, or can we just not do without the personal interaction for that? I mean, I think it takes, it takes time um, and it takes just like care and attention. Like, so since the pandemic, I've, I've started a, a, a project with like a new team of people and I've, you know, I've never met them in person, um, but I, I spend time with them every, every few days and, I, I, I try to be really present, um, but I've also introduced like uh, uh, virtual team building activities as well. <laughs> so like okay. every other, yeah, every other week at our meetings, I, I say, okay, time for team building. <laughs> and then I just, and then, I mean, I, I make sure that they're not too long um, because I, I don't want it to take up too much of their time. And I know that they're getting fatigued by the end of the meeting. So I say, well, you know, this, it's not gonna be very long. And, um, um, and yeah, I, I've had some great, uh, great successes from that. So it might be, oh, you know, what animal would you be if you had to be an animal? Or here's a list of 10 items. If you could take th three to a deserted island, like mm -hmm. what would you take? Um, but other ideas are like, you could show off like your favorite thing in, in your house, or you could talk about your favorite movie, um, or um, you could like clean a portion of your house and then uh, show people like, you know, house tour of that portion of the house. Like, you know, I clean okay. my living room today. This is my living room. <laughs> um, so things like that, just, just so you're not like, you know, on all the time, you're not like needing to talk about your project or needing to talk about work and, you know, needing to be on and wanting to be a pro appear professional and, you know, performing at that high level all the time. These team building activities are just like, let's just relax. Let's just talk about something really silly and, and, you know, have a, have a fun debate about, 
um, where the match ticks are more valuable or fishing nets. <laughs> so you, I mean, you've operated remote teams essentially your whole career. Um, is there anything that this particular COVID period has has taught you about that, or is essentially uh, that style of operating just has has continued through it? There's no particular challenges you faced through this COVID time. I mean, you're correct. Like since RoboGals, like I've I've managed remote teams, and I think a big difference is that we realized in RoboGals really early on that um, if we just establish a relationship over um, like virtually, it it wasn't as sticky. It wasn't as like um, as tight and good. And so what we realized really early on was, oh, we need to have that initial in-person meeting where um, where we spend time together physically and we do a whole lot of activities in order to really establish that relationship and really strong connection. And so that's why like with RoboGals, when we set up new chapters, we would like go to like that, that region and have a conference there and invite those people to the conference. So they'd get to spend three days with us and we'll have all these talks about the culture of RoboGals and the different roles in RoboGals and uh, robotics workshops and um, how to manage teams and how to run teams and how to lead things. And, and we'd have lots of like activities, karaoke, um, paintballing, uh, things like that, just, you know, fun things. Um, mostly laser tag actually, instead of paintballing, because paintballing is too painful. Yeah, it totally um, is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then, and what we found is like, when we ran those conferences for three days, it meant, you know, we could establish that relationship with these people mm. in, in like Europe and India or in North America, but also they could establish relationships within their newly created RoboGals chapter and it made for a much stronger team and they could be much more productive and, um, and had a much higher survival rate than if we went and recruited like someone like a lone ranger remotely. Mm. Um, and with, I mean, with COVID, um, that's what makes like this recent team that I've recruited different because I, I haven't, haven't actually met them in person. And so I think, um, uh, yeah, just trying to be like really conscious, like how do I build trust with this person? Um, and, and I think like in terms of building trust with people like one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of the the principles that you'd use in person apply uh, virtually as well. Um, so just, yeah, like being committed to their growth, um, um, like, yeah, just being like authentic with them in terms of your feedback. Uh, so, um, and, and hence being really authentic, like with feedback on your own work that you bring to the team. So I, I would say, oh, this is my work. And I know like, I still need to work on it. It's not quite there yet. It's not very good. This isn't good. That's not good. This is all right. And, and that like kind of allows me to then say the same thing about their work. Like, oh, this is good. That's not quite good. Mm -hmm. Oh, how can we like massage that and work on that a bit more? And oh, like, will the end user really like understand that if we portray that that way? Like, how could we make it so that the end user understands that a bit better? Um, and so I think it's like all the things that you'd need to do in person, but like amplified in your interactions with that person. Um, the other thing I think is, uh, it, when you're around someone for like eight hours a day, then, you know, sometimes you're working, they're working, you're getting lunch. It's, it's not as intense, but if you're only meeting them for like a zoom meeting, like an hour or two here or there every week, like you need to really generate and bring your energy and be all there and be with them and, and like really try and have a really fantastic interaction with that person because like, you know, you, you bring all that energy and they have a great experience and then yeah, after a couple of days they forget and so you need to like keep bringing that um and keep generating that because yeah the, the half-life is very is very quick okay yeah i think having that mindfulness and showing vulnerability as a leader but then also as a as a team member being conscious as well of this interaction is well it, it's going to be tough and it's a tough lesson but i hope it's one we're all learning um another experience that we're all struggling with is is in the working from home environment is trying to engage uh kids now you've done a lot of work with uh young um uh young people across the world in fact and a question from lisa horsley has uh, asked have you got any tips for engaging kids in the working from home environment but but particularly noting that you can't take equipment to students or young kids at this point. There's the hands-on experiential learning challenge. So what can you do in this with the limited equipment? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not a parent, so hats off to all the parents out there. I think it's so challenging. Um, so I have, um, I mean, I just have, I, I have, yeah, I think it's tough for the kids as well because they're used to being around other kids. They're used to having social interactions. Uh, I, I think, you just want to yeah give them as many different experiences as possible like oh 
yeah, like cook, here's, let's cook some food or let's, you know, do something in the garden or, um, yeah, like maybe Google like science, science experiments for the home or like science experiments that kids can work on for, for like two to three hours so I can get my work done. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so are you doing, but you've, you've actually got some, some exciting things in the works, right? To also help I a little do, bit. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm working on a um, computer science curriculum for kids from five to 17 to learn how to code. Uh, and so the idea is that uh, they start the curriculum whenever, whenever they you know, whenever they want and uh, they work their way through. Um, and by the time they reach the end of the curriculum, they have like they have all the they have up to like a second year uh, computer science students level of knowledge. Um, and so they're introduced to like different concepts along the way using like games and uh, and solving challenges. Uh, and so they learn like Blockly, HTML, CSS, Python, Java, and advanced concepts in that and projects through that as well. Uh, so yeah, I'm working on a project to create this program right now. And uh, we're doing a really small beta test at the end of October. And uh, so if you have any kids out there who would be interested in, in trying our, our beta test, um, yeah, please email me, hello at maritashang.com and it'd be great to get in touch with you and uh, and have your kids try our program. I think it's a very small beta. Yeah, yeah. Very, <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> noting it's restricted. And, work, and then we'll go away and work on it for a few more months and then we'll get your kids back and say, hey, have we improved this, et cetera. So yeah, it'll, right. be, it'll, be, it'll be fun. It'll be a partnership. But yeah, so it's a very, very exciting project and um, I, I, I love I love working on it and I'm so excited about the possibilities and honestly I'm creating it because I would have loved to have done this when I was when I was 10 growing up in Cairns I was like oh I really want to like learn how to code and you know there wasn't anything out there for me to do that and um yeah but if there was a program and my mom could have signed me up I would have I would have begged my mom <laughs> so that noting again the, the email was hello at moonshine.com marita maritacheng.com oh marita cheng I was like what? <laughs> is that the name of the company moonshine <laughs> Okay, um, we have uh, a question okay. from uh, 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 Luciana, Lu Luciana, sorry, Luciana, I can't even read my own writing. Um, noting the future where robots are owned, as it were, um, and we are essentially outsourcing our work to them. Is this a, is this a new form of, of slavery, uh, she has asked, or perhaps indentured servitude, other ways to, to phrase it, however you like. Um, is this something that we should take seriously uh, as, as, a, as a consideration for how we actually employ robots in the future? Um, I mean, I think, I think we still need to experiment with a lot of different robot uh, business models in order to figure out what works. Um, I mean, we've seen the deployment of robots in our day-to-day -day lives, like over the past decades, um, our washing machine, our, our dishwasher, our, our fridges are getting smarter. Um, so we welcome these things into our lives. We welcome the washing machine because that's given us an extra day back to our week. Uh, mm. uh, I mean, that's mothers used to stay at home and spend a day a week doing the laundry. Now it's, you know, let's throw it in the washing machine and that's done. Um, in, in terms of like robots uh, on a larger scale, um, it, there's been talk about like, how do we tax the robots? Um, how do we, I mean, if, if robots are producing all this work and humans aren't producing the work and aren't, and hence aren't getting paid to produce the work, like how are humans going to consume the end product? Yeah. And so I think we still have to, we still have to figure all this stuff out. Um, yeah. In terms of robots, I, I think we've seen like robotics companies really uh, experiment with a, yeah, with a whole host of business models over the past uh, like 10 years. Um, there was like selling robots directly. Um, uh, but that was, that was difficult because you need like a maintenance and a um, model in order to maintain the robots. So you need some subscri subscri yeah, subscription model. Um, yeah. I mean, there's robots as a service, which was, uh, which is like more popular now where uh, companies like lease the ro companies or individuals lease the robots and hence they get the benefits and the service and the maintenance without needing to pay a, a huge upfront fee. Um, you've also got companies where they're creating robots in their own factories um, and having their own robots produce the product um, that, that is then sold to the end user. Uh, for example, uh, like robots that, uh, that grow um, 
herbs and cabbages and basil. Um, uh, so, so um, like 20 minutes from me, there's a hydroponic uh, robotic uh, farm where it's like a warehouse um, and uh, the robots, uh, the, the plants are, uh, go from seedlings um, to like, you know, larger plants to, to the largest plants. So there's like three different sizes and they make basil, they make um, cabbages. And the robot's job is to transfer the, the seedlings to the second size, to the third size. And, um, and the effectiveness of that is that the seedlings take up, you know, less room than the, than the fully formed plants. Um, and, and yeah, they're, they're selling their products to supermarkets all over, um, all over California. Um, Look, I, lo I love this idea of robotic farmers and, and this future. So right. there's obviously a lot of, of societal issues yeah. um, and the ways to make it work, uh, be addressed, I guess, in the future. But, and that's perhaps for a bigger conversation. Um, yeah. I might just, just end on what ha what's your most, I guess, um, exciting thought for the future? What, what really is, is your kind of uh, uh, driving yeah. hope? Yeah, see. sure. Like, so I'm really, really excited about the computer science program, obviously, and, and having kids be these super geniuses by the time they're 18. Um, I mean, another project that we're working on now is our Jeevaroo robotic arm uh, project in, in Melbourne. It's an integral freedom robot arm. Uh, it's a movable platform with the arm on top of it. And the movable platform has harmonic, harmonic drive, so it can go... Um, hard left, right, like a crab, forward and backwards, and rotate on the spot. Uh, and then you've got a limb on top of that that um, has two linear actuators, which mean that uh, the arm can be positioned at various angles. Um, and then you have some stepper motors that are set back on this arm um, in order for the arm to lift things and manipulate things. And this arm can actually lift three and a half kilos from 80 centimeters away. So it's like, 80 centimeters, oh, yeah. So like you can lift more than me, and um, <laughs> like I can't, I can't lift three and a half kilos from from uh, 80 centimeters away. I don't think, I don't think my arms even 80 centimeters. And um, so it's actually designed to be used in the home for to help people with disabilities, uh, where someone with a disability might want something like a glass of water in the middle of the night, and so they press a button, um, a carrier can telepresence into the robot navigate the robot to the kitchen, grab a drink from the fridge, bring it back to the person in his bed. Whole interaction takes less than 10 minutes. Um, person with a disability is happy. They have their, uh, they have their drink within uh, 10 minutes. The carer, um, they can work from home uh, mm -hmm. or after that 10 minute interaction, they can then like help another client elsewhere. Um, and we, as we get older and uh, there's a, there's a, uh, two of the four uh, highest, uh, fastest growing jobs in the next decade are actually related to home caregiving. Uh, so there's a really big need for like caregiving in the home. Um, and so this means high quality of life for the carers, uh, still plenty of opportunities for the carers. Uh, carers are still needed to be in the home to cook meals for the person with disability or do higher level tasks. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think this is a really exciting opportunity. And also like once we, um, you know, once we've like made this work effectively for people with disabilities or, uh, or people who, uh, in care homes who are very elderly, then we can um, make it available to the masses. And uh, I love yeah, it. so that's really exciting. A, ca a more caring, inclusive and empowered future. Thank you so much, Maria Chang. It has been a delight speaking with you. Stay safe in lockdown and we'll see you on the other side in Australia again soon. I yeah, hope. yeah, sounds great. Okay, well, enjoy the rest of your T-Form conference. It has been a pleasure and a delight uh, getting to talk about this future. We'll see yeah. you next time.